Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you today as part of the second annual conference at the Robert Menzies Institute. I apologise that I'm not able to be with you in person. I'm actually in Geneva at the moment as part of Australia's um, sixth periodic review under the Convention Against Torture. We've had two days of public hearings with the Committee Against Torture, which have covered a really broad range of topics. But relevant, relevantly to our discussions today, the Committee actually asked a number of questions at yesterday's public session of the Australian delegation around Australia's counterterrorism laws, and specifically the question of how you ensure that national security laws strike an appropriate balance between protecting public safety but also upholding human rights. And that's the theme that I wanted to explore with you this morning by reflecting on the attempts by Menzies to ban the Australian Communist Party. And part of the reason that I think reflecting on this is so important is because it really encapsulates what is an enduring dilemma for liberal democracies. That is, if you're committed to freedom and democracy, in what circumstances and to what extent should you be willing to compromise or even to sacrifice entirely your core beliefs in order to defeat threats and enemies? And this continues to be an issue that Australia grapples with. To give two examples from my own personal experience, I don't think anybody from the Institute was actually aware of this when we were discussing the topic for this conference, but I actually wrote my law thesis, um, my honours thesis back in 2002 on this very issue, looking at the constitutional validity of the first set of counterterrorism laws that were introduced by the Howard government following the September 11 attacks and examining the constitutional limits within Australia that inform this balancing of national security concerns with the protection of civil liberties. At the time those measures were introduced, they were described by a parliamentary joint committee as being the most controversial pieces of legislation considered by the parliament in recent times. And the then Attorney General Darrell Williams described those reforms as measures that are extraordinary but so too are the evils at which they're directed. And that language will sound familiar to you when we go on this morning to reflect on some of Menzies' speeches relating to the banning of the Communist Party. The second example is an event occurring in a few days' time when I'll be representing the Australian Human Rights Commission in a public hearing conducted by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor as part of his review into Division 105A of the Criminal Code, which is the legislative scheme that allows for the continuing detention of terrorist offenders after they've completed their custodial sentence, where a court is satisfied they pose a continuing risk to the community. The issues raised when we reflect on Menzies' attempts to ban the Communist Party are still issues that we confront today. Across these three examples, the Menzies era attempts to ban the Communist Party, the national security legislation introduced by the Howard government following the September 11 terrorist attacks, and the counter-terrorism laws designed to protect Australia from present-day terrorist threats, we can see the same core question arise. Namely, what liberty should be provided to the enemies of liberty? On one view, as expressed by President Barak of the Supreme Court of Israel, while democracy fights with one hand tied behind her back, she nonetheless has the upper hand since preserving the rule of law and recognition of individual liberties strengthen her and her spirit and allow her to overcome her difficulties. That was really the view expressed by Robert Menzies in earlier years, where he actively resisted the idea of banning the Australian Communist Party on the grounds that, in his words, in time of peace, doubts ought to be resolved in favour of free speech. Back in 1939, when introducing the National Security Bill into the Australian Parliament, the then Prime Minister Menzies observed, and I quote, the greatest tragedy that could overcome a country 
would be for it to fight a successful war in defence of liberty, but to lose its own liberty in the process. In a speech given in 1946, Menzies described it as a very, very serious step in peacetime to prohibit the association of people for the promulgation of any particular political views. And he stated, referring to communism, that we must not let it be thought that they are such a force in political philosophy that we cannot meet them. Menzies' view at the time was that democratic values would triumph over communism if there was an open competition of ideas. For example, in a speech given to the parliament in 1947, Menzies declared that, I have complete confidence in the basic sanity of our own people. If we deal with these people, referring to the communists, openly, we shall defeat them. Of course, his approach across these years, which suggested that individual rights should be restricted as little as possible, consistently with preserving national security, is bookended by the fact that Menzies, in fact, dissolved the Communist Party first in 1940 and again in 1950. In 1940, the Menzies-led United Australia Party Country Party Government dissolved the Communist Party under the National Security Subversive Associations regulations on the basis that it was a body that was prejudicial to the defence of the Commonwealth and the efficient prosecution of the war. This was accompanied by the banning of communist publications and government raids of party premises. The ban on the party and publications was subsequently lifted by the Curtin government in 1942 and the regulations were eventually held to be invalid by the High Court in the Jehovah's Witnesses case in 1943. In the years following the conclusion of World War II, Menzies is on the record again as resisting the idea of banning communism and the Communist Party. But by the 1949 federal election, his position had shifted again. He's been described as some, by some as being deeply conflicted over the question of the ban or even inconsistent in relation to his views on this issue. Some have described his position and the changing views that he expressed as reflecting a Machiavellian belief that divisions within the Labor Party made the issue one with the potential to split that party and thereby destroy it, or that he may have been responding to political pressures by virtue of the fact that a number of allied organisations, including the Returned Services League, the Australian Constitutional League, the Victorian League of Rights and the Country Party, had all campaigned strongly in favour of a ban being adopted. While there is no doubt that Menzies understood the politics of this issue, and perhaps it's not surprising that our longest serving Prime Minister was adept at making the most of the political opportunities that did present themselves, it's also possible to conclude that Menzies' approach to this issue, despite his views changing, was still grounded in values and principles. My reading is that Menzies' core views did not themselves change. He had always recognised the need to strike a balance between security and freedom and consistently understood the significance of limiting freedoms any more than absolutely necessary in order to preserve the public good and national security. What did change was his perception of events and the nature of the threat being faced, and that then changed his assessment of where the balance should lie. And there's no doubt that in those few years between 1946 and the federal election in 1949, there had been significant developments, both within Australia and internationally, that highlighted the growing influence and what Menzies perceived as the growing threat of communism. Examples in Australia included industrial unrest, such as the coal strike that lasted for seven weeks in mid-1949, and an ongoing rail strike in Queensland that was widely believed to be communist-inspired. 
the international context was particularly significant, including the communist coup in Czechoslovakia in February 1948, the blockade of West Berlin, and the detonation of the first Soviet nuclear weapon in August 1949. In a public statement in March 1948, Mendes observed that recent events have made it quite clear that Australian communism is treasonable, anti-democratic and destructive. In view of the gravity of the international situation and the vital importance of Australian production and transport, communist activities can no longer be tolerated. The records support the conclusion that the changes in Menzies' approach from banning the Communist Party back in 1939-40 to then resisting efforts to ban the Communist Party immediately following the war to then taking a policy to the 1949 federal election to again ban the Communist Party wasn't purely political, nor was it purely populist, but in fact it reflected an evolving assessment of the threat being faced. And the records do suggest that Menzies was conflicted over the Liberal Party policy to ban the Communist Party, which was a policy that was first unanimously adopted by the party on the 11th of March 1948. There were reports at the time that Menzies was amongst a group of Liberals who'd argued against the adoption of the policy at that August, oh, at that March meeting. And his diaries on a subsequent trip to London highlight his doubts about whether banning the Communist Party was the correct approach. Whatever his private doubts, though, uh, Menzies took a clear public commitment to banning the Communist Party to the 1949 federal election. In announcing that the Liberals' election platform would include a ban on the Communist Party, Menzies emphasised that war with the Soviet Union was foreseeable and that it would have been, in his words, and I quote, madness to wait until you were at war before you take steps to protect yourself. He described communism in Australia as an alien and destructive pest and stated that, and I quote, the day has gone for treating communism as a legitimate political philosophy. After winning the election in 1949, the Communist Party Dissolution Bill was introduced by the newly elected Menzies government as one of their first major measures. The recitals in the bill sought to describe the nature of the threat being addressed, with, for example, one recital describing the Australian Communist Party as engaging in activities or operations that were designed to bring about the overthrow or dislocation of the established system of government. The Act had three distinct categories of targets. The first was the Australian Communist Party itself, which was to be declared an unlawful association, with the result that it was dissolved and its property forfeited without compensation. The second was organisations that either supported communism or were affiliated with the Communist Party, such as trade unions, which could be declared unlawful by the Governor General which then meant that the organisation would be dissolved and that any membership of that organisation would become unlawful. It was an offence punishable by five years' imprisonment to be an officer or member of an unlawful association knowingly. Finally, the third target was individuals, with the Governor-General being able to declare a person to be a communist and engaged or likely to engage in activities prejudicial to Australia's security or defence, which then meant that the person could not hold office in the public service, nor could they hold any positions in industries vital to the security or defence of Australia. The onus of proving that a person was not a communist under this law lay with the person themselves. There were only limited, and I would suggest, overwhelmingly inadequate safeguards built into the Act. Reflecting on this law, George Williams has described it as, and I quote, one of the most draconian and unfortunate pieces of legislation ever to be introduced into the federal parliament. It threatened to herald an era of McCarthyism in Australia and to undermine accepted and revered Australian values 
such as the presumption of innocence, freedom of belief and speech, and the rule of law. Perhaps demonstrating the dangers of these types of laws, during his second reading speech, Menzies read out the names of 53 prominent Australians holding senior office in trade unions or key industries who he claimed were senior communists. He referred to this group as a traitorous minority which threatened the security of the nation, but then had to correct this list a fortnight later with respect to five of those names after admitting that it contained errors. During the parliamentary debate, Menzies addressed the criticism that his proposed law banning communism undermined liberty and democracy by asking the question, after all, what liberty should there be for the enemies of liberty under law? Menzies acknowledged that the bill was admittedly novel and far-reaching, but described it as a law relating to the safety and defence of Australia that was designed to give the government the power to deal with the king's enemies in this country. He directly acknowledged his previous opposition to banning the Communist Party, explaining that events have moved. He said, we're not at peace today, except in a technical sense, and he referenced the most threatening events in Eastern Europe, in Germany, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. The legislation found broad support amongst key parts of the Australian media. The Canberra Times editorialised that freedom in the accepted British sense should be suspended until it was no longer under threat from the cancer of communism. And the Brisbane Courier Mail argued that if democratic liberty is to be preserved for all who believe in it, it must be defended against enemies who would destroy it. It cannot allow itself to be used for its own destruction. And that is the only use communists have for free speech and other democratic rights. Now, that's not to say that the law wasn't controversial or criticised. For example, The Age warned that the bill was more drastic than many liberal-minded people would have expected, and the London Times issued a warning that sounds familiar when we consider today's debates around counter-terrorism laws, cautioning that methods which imperil fundamental freedoms, once written into a statute book, may be used in years to come for purposes not remotely to be envisaged now. 32 academics from the University of Sydney warned that the illiberal bill exposed Australia to the charge of employing the same tactics as the communists. And an open letter published by The Age from 14 academics from the University of Melbourne condemned the bill as dangerous and unwise because it departed from the fundamental democratic freedoms of constitutional and criminal law and condemned it as an example of democracy fighting totalitarianism by some of its own methods and thus undermining faith in the values of democracy without which no democracy can stand. It was probably put most bluntly by Norman Cowper, later Sir Norman, who'd previously stood for Parliament as a candidate with the United Australia Party and was closely associated at this time with the Liberal Party. He wrote um, a contribution to the Australian Quarterly and said, why oppose Satan if we're going to adopt his ways? Despite these concerns, the public was clearly in favour of the proposal by a fairly substantial majority. An Australian Gallup poll in May 1950 found that 80% of voters were in favour of banning the Australian Communist Party. The bill was initially opposed by the Labor Party However, reading that public sentiment and fearing that a double dissolution could be called, the federal executive of the Labor Party directed its members to withdraw their opposition and to allow the bill to pass. Given that, the Act became law on the 20th of October 1950. Of course, the passage of this Act was not the end of the story. A High Court challenge was launched by the Australian Communist Party, 10 trade unions, and Communist Union officials. With Dr Herbert Evatt, then the Deputy Leader of the Labor Opposition, accepting a brief to appear in the High Court on behalf of the Waterside Workers' Federation, a move that the New South Wales President of the Labor Party described as ethically correct 
professionally sound and politically very, very foolish. The Communist Party case remains one of the most significant constitutional cases in Australian history, with the High Court striking down the Communist Party Dissolution Act by a six to one majority. The case has been described by constitutional law scholars as a celebrated victory for the rule of law. While all judges acknowledged that the Commonwealth had the legislative power to protect itself from subversion, they found that this act went significantly further than that. This has been described by George Winterton as one of the most important decisions ever rendered by the High Court in terms of its confirmation of fundamental constitutional principles such as the rule of law, its impact on civil liberties, and its symbolic importance as a reaffirmation of judicial independence. Following this, Menzies called a double dissolution election, ostensibly on the basis that the Senate had twice failed to pass the Commonwealth Bank Bill, but in reality, the issue that dominated the campaign was communism. The Liberal Party candidate in the seat of Barton, the seat that was held by Dr Evatt, was World War II hero Nancy Wake, who campaigned on the slogan, I am the defender of freedom, Dr Evatt is the defender of communism, which gives you an idea of how the politics was playing out around this issue. The Menzies government won that election and then sought to change the Australian constitution to insert a provision to give the Commonwealth government the power to make laws in reference to communism and communists. Dr Evatt, who was now leader of the opposition, described the amendment as one of the most dangerous measures that has ever been submitted to the legislature of an English-speaking people. The referendum campaign reflected the core question that I highlighted at the beginning of this discussion. What is the right balance between security and freedom? And Ivor Greenwood, who was later to serve as a minister in the McMahon and Fraser governments, described the referendum legislation as completely contrary to all that liberalism stands for. The referendum was held on the 22nd of September 1951 and was lost. Reflecting on this in the context of the later debate over counter-terrorism legislation in Australia following September 11, then Prime Minister John Howard stated in 2002 that he believed the Australian people made the right decision in rejecting the proposal. An interesting observation about that referendum, perhaps in light of referendums that are currently being planned in Australia, is to note that three months prior to the referendum being put and lost, a Gallup poll indicated that the ban was actually supported by 73.3% of those surveyed. And if the referendum had been held on that date, it may well have been won. It's also important not to lose sight of how close this vote actually was. The national yes vote in favour of effectively banning the Communist Party was 49.4%, with only around 52,000 votes out of over 4.6 million that were cast around the nation, separating the yes from the no total. If 30,000 people in either South Australia or Victoria had voted yes rather than no, the proposal would have succeeded and the Communist Party would have been banned. Which again just serves to reflect this constant tension in this question about security versus liberty, and the fact that there isn't ever a single clear answer, but a constant balancing that needs to be accommodated. While this was effectively the end of the formal attempts to ban the Communist Party by the Menzies government, there were subsequent policy decisions taken by the government to address concerns about communism and to strengthen national security. Examples include the Royal Commission into Soviet Espionage in 1954-1955, which was set up in the wake of the 1954 Petrov Affair, and Australian foreign policy under Menzies, which was strongly focused on stopping the spread of communism, particularly within Asia. The fundamental question about striking that balance didn't go away, and it remains a key issue today, which leads me to the conclusion of asking, well, what can we learn from the attempts by Menzies to ban the Communist Party? 
And to my mind, there are two key lessons that we can draw. The first is that strong public policy requires a combination of both clear core values, but also pragmatism. There are always trade-offs and compromises, and shifting the balance in response to changing circumstances isn't a sign of philosophical inconsistencies. In Menzies' case, it was a reflection of reality. But at the same time, the final lesson to be drawn is that there are limits beyond which core values cannot and must not be compromised, lest the very fibre of the nation be irretrievably altered. And that's the final lesson. That is, we cannot pass laws that undermine the very democratic freedoms that we're seeking to protect from terrorism. A key responsibility of any government is to always protect national sovereignty and the safety of its people, but ensuring that our laws in this area balance the protection of national security with a strong respect for human rights and freedoms isn't a sign of weakness. Quite the opposite. It's a clear indication of the strength of our nation, our values as a nation, and our enduring belief in freedom and democracy. And I think those are the core lessons that really can be drawn from reflecting on the Minzies era and the various moves around whether or not the Communist Party should be banned. And I might leave it at that, Georgina, and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lorraine. That's been great. A uh, question from George Brandis there. Lorraine, it's George Brandis speaking. Um, can I start by congratulating you on an e absolutely excellent presentation? I think it was extremely balanced as well as very uh, judicious, and I agree with virtually every word you said. I just wanted to add a couple of, as it were, footnotes to what you said and uh, under thought. First of all, I think we should also remind ourselves that at the 1946 election, this was actually one of the big issues, not between the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, but between the Liberal Party and the Country Party, because they split on the issue openly. It's one of the reasons they did that the, the opposition did pretty poorly, because Fadden was running around saying we should ban the Communist Party. And Menzies was saying, being a good liberal, no, we shouldn't because it would be an attack on democratic freedoms. Secondly, there is one other factor that would have weighed in Menzies' mind, if not before 1949, then certainly once he was in office, and that is the briefings he received. And he went to London and Washington and received briefings from the, from, briefings from the CIA in Washington and from MI6 in London, and that sharpened his awareness of the threat that communism posed uh, in the early days of the Cold War. So his thinking changed from regarding this as a freedom of speech issue in peacetime to being the equivalent of what he'd done in 1940 and regarding it as a defence of the realm issue uh, in the Cold War era. Thirdly, it's important, I think, to remind ourselves that when he introduced the bill, the bill was not primarily directed at individuals. It was directed at groups. And the analogy that I think can be drawn, that as it were saves Menzies' reputation as a, a, a defender of freedom of speech, is that it was analogous to a criminal conspiracy or a treasonable conspiracy by groups. And even that limb of the bill, which dealt with in the proscription of individuals, it's important to observe did not deal with the proscription of the expression of opinions. Now, contrast that with the Williams Bill in 2001, which, among other things, made it a criminal offence to, to praise terrorism. Uh, that was an, an act, that is an actual prohibition on the expression of an opinion. 
Now, Menzies' bill actually didn't go so far as that. Lastly, um, I'm glad you mentioned Ivor Greenwood and his honourable role in defeating the referendum. We should also mention Alan Misson, um, another Victorian liberal and contemporary of Greenwood's, who argued the case as well. And interestingly, whereas Ivor Greenwood was a rock-ribbed right-winger and Alan Misson was a dripping wet on the left of the Liberal Party, both of them were good liberals in a philosophical sense and both of them found common ground in opposing the referendum. Thank you. Thanks, George. Lorraine, did you have any comments in response to George's comments? Oh, only that I think all of those things that were said really do highlight that core point that I don't think the events over the years and those changing positions of Menzies demonstrate any change in fundamental core values or any inconsistency, but instead do reflect that changing understanding or assessment of what the threat was. And so it does highlight that I think you can quite consistently believe in the importance of strong national security and also the importance of upholding individual rights and freedoms. It's really a question then of where the balance lies and that can change over time. Great. Any other questions for Lorraine? Anne? Yeah, one final one. Thanks. Um, this is not a, a comment really on the pros and cons of the bill or the, or the referendum, but I think Robert Menzies never put forward another referendum and what it showed was how difficult it is to get a yes vote in a referendum. Um, present government beware. That is an ex It was an extraordinary result, but as you rightly pointed out, it was extraordinary because of its closeness. And the campaign that Revit waged very eloquently should have had a much bigger margin and didn't. And John Howard has said it was the only election in all his time with his parents where his mother and father voted differently. <laughs> and that, I think, says an awful lot. And I, I commend you on what you your, your paper. It was excellent. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, Tom. Uh, my grandparents also apparently differed. My grandfather voted in favour of the ban and my grandmother voted against. So, And my grandfather was actually a minister of Menzies' government. So, <laughs> <laughs> Could I make one quick comment, Georgina, just about the referendums? Sure. It's an interesting point because we often hear this um, argument that, oh, referendums in Australia are really difficult to pass, and they are, but there's a really good reason for that, and that's that you don't want your constitution to be able to ebb and flow with the political winds, actually having that consistency and having referendums that force the Australian people to really consider and want to change if it's going to be successful, I think is actually one of the um, key features of our constitution and something that adds to that stability and consistency. So I'd put forward the view that it's not that referendums are too hard to pass, perhaps it's that the right referendum questions that are acceptable to the Australian people haven't been put forward. <laughs> Lorraine, no, so sound uh, remarks as normal, as usual. Uh, could we please put this period, the early 1950s, in a broader Western context? Sorry for my ignorance, but what was New Zealand, Canada, Britain and the United States doing with respect to um, Communist Party um, uh, membership in their countries? That, that's Tom Switzer, by the way, Lorraine, if you didn't recognise his dulcet tones. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Well, actually, one of the most interesting um, comparisons is to the United States because, of course, they took quite a different approach in terms of the sort of McCarthyist um, targeting of individuals. And there are some interesting academic articles that look at efforts that were made to send Australia down that path as well um, and some quite interesting comparisons between why Australia or the government in Australia chose to try and adopt the laws that it did rather than really following the American example. Um, and I think it is a really interesting comparison, um, particularly because there were um, certainly elements within, I understand, the Liberal Party and the Country Party that were actually pushing for that at the time, for that McCarthy-type approach um, to really looking at, at targeting individuals in a way that um, the banning of the Communist Party didn't really do. Thanks so much, Lorraine, for zooming in from Geneva. All the best with the hearings and uh, 
look forward to seeing your chapter in a few months' time. Thank you. Thanks so much.